Hello, welcome to chapter two, the PowerPoint for biology for majors. Uh, this is again for the OpenStax book, Biology 2E. This is chapter two, the chemistry of life. So as usual, we're gonna start off with your objectives for this chapter. Um, in this PowerPoint, I have four objectives for you. The first being uh, be able to identify the chemical components of life. Second, recognize elements and the six common to all life. Third, recognize atomic structure. And fourth, recognize three types of bonds. So let's start by talking about atoms. Atoms make up all matter. And we did start talking about atoms in the last chapter, um, just that atoms form molecules, which then in turn form cells, which are the smallest uh, forms and sources of life. Um, so atoms do make up all matter. And matter is actually any material that takes up space. So that is living or non-living. Um, matter makes up every object and consists of one or more elements. And an element is a substance that cannot be broken down by chemical means into other substances. Um, whenever we talk about elements, we're talking about the elements that you find on the periodic table. And basically, if you've had a chemistry class or if you plan on taking a chemistry class, you'll learn that um, a lot of the math behind chemistry comes when you're adding chemicals together to make something new. Um, so when you break those chemicals back down into their basic forms, that's when you find their basic elements, what they are made up of. And this diagram on the right side of the slide is actually an example from your book. This is um, an element, this is actually helium. So what you'd find in like a floating helium balloon. Um, Helium is made up of atoms. Atoms are made up of protons and neutrons located within the nucleus with electrons in orbitals surrounding the nucleus. So if we're looking at the diagram, protons are this red positive. Neutrons, which are neutral, are these yellow. Electrons are blue and they're floating, like it says, surrounding uh, the nucleus here in orbit. Uh, they're actually negative. If you look closely enough, you'll see a little negative sign and then the nucleus is right here. So this uh, example represents helium. So this slide actually shows you the most common elements in life. Um, these are the elements that you need to learn whenever you're taking them away from this chapter. These are the ones I want you to know. Um, so we have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And if you look at it, the acronym that people use is CHOMPS, C-H-O-N-P-S. Um, those are the most common elements to life. They're things that you're going to see in life every single day. Um, and after this chapter, hopefully we break it down enough to where you actually kind of realize where you can find these things. So bear with me because we're gonna start digging a little more into the chemistry um, and the math sort of behind the atomic structure um, of atoms. So atoms are composed of three smaller particles, which we hit on a couple of slides ago. And those par particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, like we mentioned, protons are represented by a plus sign. They're positive. Neutrons are neutral. And electrons are negative. Um, also, like we mentioned in the previous slide, protons and um, neutrons are found within the nucleus of an atom within the center and the electrons are in orbit around uh, that nucleus. So this is again an helium uh, atom, which should look very similar to a couple of slides previous. Uh, this actually contains two protons, which re are represented by the red positive, um, two neutrons, which are blue in this example, and then two electrons in orbit, which are the gray negatives. Um, protons and neutrons are closer together in the nucleus, which is the center of the atom. Electrons surround the nucleus, like we've said, they're very small, meaning electrons, they're very small, they move very fast. And the atomic number indicates how many protons are in each atom of that element. So in the past um, slide, you actually saw the atomic numbers and the symbols for all of the most common um, elements found in life. And the atomic number is represented by um, the amount of protons within that atom. So in this example, what would you think helium's atomic number would be? So helium's atomic number is going to be two because there are two protons. Um, the atomic nucleus does contain both protons and neutrons. The electrons are in orbit, like we've said. Um, it contains positively charged particles, which are your protons in the nucleus. Neutral or uncharged particles are also in the nucleus, and then electrons are negatively charged. 
um, electrons are the smallest subparticle uh, within an atom, and protons and neutrons have approximately the same mass. They're very similar in size. Uh, these form atoms, then molecules, and then eventually cells, much like we talked about in the last slideshow. The atomic nucleus contains protons and neutrons, and once again, the electrons are in orbit around that nucleus. So let's talk briefly about charge and mass. So protons, which I'm labeling here the same colors that we had in the last slide, protons have a positive charge and they have a mass of one AMU and AMU will stand for atomic mass unit. Um, neutrons have no charge at all and they also have a mass of one AMU. So like we mentioned in the last slide, they're both found in the nucleus in the center of the atom. They both are very similar in size and in weight and mass. And then electrons have a negative charge and they have a mass of zero AMU, atomic mass units. And they move very quickly and they're much smaller than protons and neutrons. And once again, they're in orbit. They are not found within the nucleus of an atom. Okay, so now that we have already talked about um, atomic mass, we've talked about atoms and elements in general, let's start talking about isotopes and ions. These are two different things. They're both um, easy to learn once you know the basics. And you may have heard of these in a high school chemistry class, but we're still gonna dig into them. So the number of protons determines the element, like we mentioned previously, and it cannot change. So the example I gave before was helium having an atomic number of two, because it has two protons, that will never change but the number of neutrons found within that nucleus can change. And when that happens, we get an isotope. Um, the number of electrons in orbit can also change. And when that happens, we get an ion. And um, that's actually a very common occurrence. So let's start off looking here at the hydrogen isotopes. So remember, like I previously stated, protons are positive and they have a mass of one atomic mass unit, one AMU. Neutrons are neutral they have a mass of one AMU as well, and electrons are negative and they have a mass of zero AMU. So this would mean if we're adding a neutron, these isotopes will have the same atomic number, so they have the same original number of protons, and they have different numbers of neutrons, which gives them a different overall atomic mass. So this is your original hydrogen element. So there's a proton here, there's an electron in orbit but we have a um, hydrogen isotope. So we have something called uh, deuterium and deuterium has one proton. It also has one neutron, which means now the atomic mass of this central nucleus is going to be two AMU rather than just the original one. That being said, it has the exact same um, place on the periodic table. Uh, basically it still has one proton and that does not change. So, then let's talk about ions. Ions is here in green. Remember, atoms are single neutral particles, and an ion is a positively or negatively charged particle. So I want to talk a little bit about that. An atom or molecule with a net electric charge due to the loss or gain of one or more electrons. So if an electron is lost or an electron is gained, you have a different ion. So in this example, we have a lithium atom that has three electrons with those gray symbols here, one, two, and three. This um, light gray or white symbol just represents that inner nucleus, so we're not worried about protons and neutrons here. Um, but in this example, lithium loses one of its electrons, which happens all the time. And now we have a lithium ion with only two electrons, and it's still lithium. It still has the same number of protons, um, but this ion just changes um, whether it's positive or negative but in this case, we're gonna have a positive change because we lost one electron. So my notes here, dig in a little bit more. It says the number of protons determines the element once again. All atoms, for example, that have six protons are considered carbon atoms, but the number of protons in an atom is called that atomic number. Carbon has an atomic number, once again, of six. That's just an example. An isotope, though, is one of two or more species of atoms of a chemical element with the same atomic number, the same number of protons that doesn't change, and it has the same position on the periodic table. It also has a nearly identical chemical behavior, but it has a different atomic mass, different numbers of neutrons. 
and it has often has different physical properties. So every chemical element has one or more isotopes. Um, an ion, once again, is an atom or molecule with a net electric charge due to the loss or gain of one or more electrons. So that outer shell will change, causing a net positive or negative charge to that original element. So in the previous slideshow, we actually talked about how atoms form molecules and um, atoms are organized into molecules, which just means that there's two or more chemically joined atoms. So for example, we can talk about a water molecule. So water molecules are composed of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And like we all know it to be H2O. So two hydrogens and one oxygen. Compounds are molecules of two or more elements, so that's a different term. So let's talk about molecules first, and that's this red section here. So this is just a water molecule. This is just an example for you. So a water molecule has two hydrogen atoms, which would be these white positive atoms on the outside, chemically joined to one oxygen atom, and that's your water molecule. And then we can talk about a compound example. So in this case, when you have water, so this is just a different form of the same thing. I use the same colors to kind of uh, keep things, you know, similar so that it was easy to see. Um, your oxygen molecule, once again, is right here. Your two hydrogens are white right here. So that's your water, just like right here. But then whenever we're adding a second hydrogen, or sorry, a second oxygen, we end up with hydrogen peroxide. So that is a compound example. So here we have the same two hydrogens but we have also two oxygens and that forms hydrogen peroxide. So the notes that I have here are that atoms use their electrons to participate in chemical reactions. So knowing an element's electron configuration can allow you to predict how it will interact with atoms of other elements. Um, electrons are the smallest atomic particle. They carry a negative charge and they orbit the atom's nucleus like we've talked about. So the best part about knowing what your electrons look like, where they sit, um, how they act within an element, is that you can understand how it's going to interact with elements um, around it. So whether they're going to combine, whether they're going to repel each other, um, that's something that's good to know when practicing chemistry. So digging into electrons a little bit more. Um, in previous examples, we haven't talked about there being multiple different what they call um, valence or energy shells around the nucleus of an atom, but there are. There's not just one um, area that an electron can sit in. There's often many. So within each energy shell, which in this example would be these, so the yellow, the green, and the blue shells indicated here, um, electrons are arranged in pairs. Unpaired electrons form bonds with other atoms. So in this example, if you look, they're arranged in pairs, meaning that um, basically it's, it's um, similar on all sides. So you have three here, three here, two here, two here. Um, everything is exactly mirrored on the other side. Now, if you had, for example, just one electron in this outer shell and you didn't have one right here, um, or if that was similar in any area, then this particular atom would bond with another to try to fill that empty valence shell. Um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So the octet rule, which is a new term, states that atoms are more stable energetically when they have eight electrons in their valence shell, which is the most uh, outermost electron shell, which is in this case blue. So when they have eight electrons in this outer shell, which this example does, um, they are the most stable energetically that they could be. But if they were missing one of these, they would look to bond to another atom near it so that it could then be um, stable. That's the goal at all times is to be the most energetically stable. So atoms are the most stable when their valence shells have no vacancies. Like I was saying, bonding with other atoms fills those vacancies. So that's what makes these compound molecules is these atoms bonding together because they need to fill those valence shells. So now that we know that our elements are always looking um, to fill those valence outer shells with their electrons, let's sort of talk about bonds because that's really what we're talking about is when these valence shells are not completely full or they don't have the eight electrons that they're looking for, they look to bond to other atoms. So let's look at the three types of bonds that we wanted to hit on in the beginning of this chapter. So we wanna talk about the hydrogen bond, the covalent bond, and the ionic bond. 
So a chemical bond is an attractive force that holds atoms together. Um, talking first, let's start with hydrogen. I have it here listed on the bottom, but it's on the left side. So let's start with that. Hydrogen bonds are actually considered the weakest of these three bonds. So individual hydrogen bonds break very easily, but in very large numbers, they can be very strong. Hydrogen bonds are very common in water. So if we're thinking about bonds, believe it or not, you can think of a rock or you can think of something as fluid as water. So a strong bond would be shared electrons. And within a rock, you're not going to be able to just stick your hand straight through a rock. But when you're going to swim or you're going to the pool, whatever, if you're near water and you put your hand through that water, you're going to be able to slice your hand right through water as if there was almost nothing there. Um, so hydrogen bonds during that process are breaking. It's easy for that to happen, um, but they are very common in water, which is why water doesn't just fully um, dissipate or break apart whenever you put your hand in, it comes right back together. Hydrogen bonds um, are strong in large quantities. So second, let's talk about covalent bonds. Covalent bonds share electrons. Um, they are very strong bonds. Uh, they actually um, involve two atoms sharing electrons together, as in this example. So like we stated before, um, atoms like to have this outer shell filled. So in this case, though, they only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, electrons in their outer valence shell. Uh, and each of these have seven, but they would prefer to have eight, right? And so this is a great example just leading you right to a covalent bond, which is strong because now both of these atoms are at their most stable state by sharing with each other. Um, so let's then talk about ionic bonds. They form when one atom gives up one or more electron uh, to form another atom. So this is one atom here. It would be giving up an electron to form with the second. Um, that's considered an ionic bond, which forms an ionic molecule. Um, so covalent and ionic bonds are very strong. Hydrogen bonds are considered weak, and they are common in things like water. Individual hydrogen bonds are weak and break easily, but many of them together can be very strong. Covalent bonds involve two atoms sharing electrons, and ionic bonds involve an atom that gains or loses an electron. So I would say that covalent bonds are the strongest, uh, ionic being middle of the road, but leaning towards a stronger electron bond. And then hydrogen bonds are um, the weakest bonds of the three. So you may have heard this before, but water is a very unique molecule. Um, water has a pH of seven, which is neutral. And pH of seven means that there is an equal dissociation of hydrogen, uh, H, and OH in solution. So cohesion is a new word we're talking about here, that is the tendency of water molecules to stick to one another, to stick together. So that's kind of what this image shows you here. Um, these are the same uh, water molecules we spoke of before. Um, in this case, they are adhering to, so they have adhesion with an outer polar or charged object, um, but then they have cohesion with one another. They're holding on to each other as well. So cohesion is the tendency of water to stick to it together. Um, cohesion between molecules on the surface of liquid water give it a high surface tension. So if you think of surface tension in general, I like to think of a duck floating on a pond. So the reason that that is possible is not only because the duck is physically built for that, um, it's also because of cohesion of water molecules. So even ourselves, we're able to sort of, a lot of us float on top of water, right? On our backs or on our stomachs. So there is a surface tension that's high. Um, those hydrogen bonds on the top of that water are strong, um, but adhesion is the tendency to form hydrogen bonds with substances other than water. So that's this example, um, water sort of grabbing onto this outer polar object. So let's talk a little bit more about pH. Um, the pH scale is based on the amount of hydrogen in a solution. Um, neutral solutions have a pH of seven, so like water. And um, a good example, so water would be the pH of seven. Um, if we're looking at more acidic things, we're gonna look at batteries, stomach acid, lemon, um, those things are going to have a low pH, so between zero and two. If you have something that's highly alkaline, you're going to have something um, that has a lot of hydrogen atoms, right? So um, that is going to be drain cleaner, bleach, soap, um, things on the higher alkaline side. Um, once again, water is your neutral, 
And um, I mean, a good example is basically when you have a chemistry course and you make something in chemistry that you need to then dispose of, a lot of times what you'll do is do your best to neutralize the new um, chemical compound that you made in order to bring it back to something like a seven um, so that it could be then sent down the sink if that's environmentally safe. Um, it isn't always, but at times it is. So basically, if you have something that you're working with that's really acidic, you're going to use something very basic to neutralize that. So the example I like to give is if you're using, um, you know, some kind of peroxide or you're using something um, very acidic, then you're going to want to use something like um, baking soda, which is highly alkaline. And it sort of will, over time, it'll neutralize with the amount of baking soda you put in. And you sort of end up with a pH of 7, and then that particular compound that you made is safe to be disposed of rather than being too acidic or too alkaline to say be poured down the sink for example. So I did mention that chemistry has some math involved and if you're more curious than this slide about the math or if you have any questions about it in our lab or um, you can get into your book kind of gets better uh, information going about the math behind chemistry but basically from this PowerPoint I just want you to take away the reactants and the products. So um, chemical reactions occur when two or more atoms bound together uh, to form molecules or when bonded atoms are then broken apart. So the um, substances used in the beginning of a chemical reaction are called the reactants, usually found on the left side of a chemical equation. The substances that are found at the end are called products and they're usually found on the right side of the equation. So if you look at this like a math equation, you have what you have here on the left side is you're adding two hydrogens with um, oxygen, correct? So in this example, this would be considered maybe an equal sign. That's kind of how I like to talk about it. So you have two hydrogens plus an oxygen will equal two H2O, so two water molecules, right? This plus this equals this. That's sort of like how I like to talk about this. Um, reactants will equal products. Right? So whether that's, in this case, bringing two uh, molecules together um, or whether it's, in a different case, maybe pulling these molecules apart. So maybe you already have two water molecules and you want two hydrogens and an oxygen. Um, that would be breaking the molecules apart. Uh, regardless of the process, the things found on the left side are the reactants, the things found on the right side are the products. Okay, so now we are down to our key takeaways from this PowerPoint. So um, our key takeaways here are that one, matter is composed of atoms. Um, two, the periodic table of elements arranges, arranges by proton number. Um, and remember again that CHOMPs or carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur are the most common elements to life. Um, atoms contain protons, neutrons, and electrons. And also please pay attention to where those are found. Um, ionic and covalent and hydrogen bonds are common to life. And if you will remember, ionic and covalent bonds are stronger. Hydrogen is normally a weaker bond. So that's the end of your second PowerPoint. Um, I will see you in the next one.